I'm Dr. Margaret Lafferty, live from the 2017 Hot Topics in Neonatology meeting here in Washington, D.C. We're joined by Dr. Suhas Kalapur from UCLA, and we're here to discuss his talk on chorioamnionitis and outcomes in humans. Welcome, Dr. Kalapur. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, Dr. Kalapur, can you tell us what was the main objective of your talk? Right. So the main objective was there have been epidemiological suggestions that exposure to antenatal inflammation and chorioamnionitis might increase the risk for wheezing disorders, uh, etc. The main focus in neonatology of chorioamnionitis is early onset sepsis, which is a relatively rare event. The more common event for pediatricians is wheezing disorders. And so we wanted to know if there is a correlation with a relatively high resolution study um, of uh, defining chorioamnionitis. That's so interesting. Can you tell us more about the design of your study? Yeah, so what we did is, that's an interesting question. Uh, we actually chose late preterm infants. The reason for choosing late preterm infants was because they would be expected to have less interventions during the NICU, which could confound the outcomes. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they are a relatively enriched population where the incidence of the disease might be a little bit more. Uh, so actually, we recruited close to 500 uh, uh, preterm infants, 32 to 36 weeks gestation. The median gestation was about 35 weeks, 2,500 grams at birth. Uh, they all, the median uh, length of stay was about four or five days, mm. and there, there was very little use of mechanical ventilators or other interventions, and none of the infants went home on any uh, home oxygen or other medications. We then followed a cohort, about 200 of them, uh, for up to two years with the uh, two things we did with that. One was a structured pulmonary questionnaire uh, to understand the burden of respiratory disease. And this validated questionnaire came from the support trial. And the other thing we did was an infant pulmonary function test, which is a pretty involved procedure. And we did that at about six to nine months of age. We administered the questionnaire uh, at two times. One is at six to 12 months of age, and the other from 18 to 24 months of age. And the outcome of interest was to ascertain the burden of wheezing disorders. And just to clarify, you um, were looking at late preterm as well as term infants, or just late preterm? We had a small term cohort as a comparator, but our main focus was the late preterm pre infants. OK, great. Um, can you tell us about the major findings of your study? Yeah, the major findings, well, first of all, we had a characterization of chorioamnionitis. As you might know, the the definition of chorioamnionitis, there is a considerable amount of confusion and even debate about what constitutes chorioamnionitis. For the obstetrician, it is the clinical presentation of fever, mm -hmm. high white count, etc., in the mother's blood. For the pathologist, it is placenta inflammation. Mm -hmm. uh, for those biochemically oriented, it is the presence of uh, cytokines, etc. And for microbiologists, it's the microorganisms. Mm -hmm. We actually had all four of these parameters uh, measured in our study. Mm -hmm. And what we found was, first of all, these cord blood cytokines are up only in a subsection of the patients. And those are the ones with chorioamnionitis and funicitis. Funicitis is not only is there inflammation in the placenta, in the extra placental membranes, but there is inflammation in the umbilical cord. So those are the patients who had high uh, IL-6 levels mm -hmm. and IL-8 levels in the, in the cord blood. Now what we did is we looked at the outcome based on whether or not there was funicitis, whether or not there was chorioamnionitis, and the third group was neither. And when we looked at that in the NICU outcomes, we actually found no difference. So there was absolutely no difference wow. in the NICU outcomes. What I mean by NICU outcomes is the length of stay, mm -hmm. usage of mechanical ventilator, or other advanced therapies. And the only predictor of that was actually the gestational age at birth, even within the narrow window of 32 to 36 weeks mm -hmm. of gestation. But when we 
<coughs> then did a pulmonary function test as a group and there is a measurement called forced expiratory flow which is a sensitive measure of small airway disease. The way uh, the pulmonary function test is done, it needs sedation uh, and there is an inflatable jacket, a uh, hugging jacket that is put on the chest of the child mm. uh, and there is a rapid squeeze that is given and the air that is expelled, you measure the flow characteristics mm -hmm. of the air and it, it takes about three hours, four hours to do and we had about 70 measurements wow. um, and, and what we found was that uh, um, as a whole there was a skewing towards the lower side uh, even when corrected for the weight and the height. Mm -hmm. So the way these numbers are reported is 100% uh, is what is predicted for that height and weight. So compared to the term normative data, even at the same height and weight, if you were born a few weeks early, then the expiratory flow characteristics were more uh, consistent with an obstructive type of a pattern. So that was one. Within the chorioamnionitis group, we uh, had a tendency towards lower measurement but did not gain significance and the reason primarily I think is we were uh, had we lacked adequate power but surprisingly we found race and gender effects African American and males had lower forced expiratory flow numbers compared to Caucasians and females so that was for the uh, infant flow uh, characteristics then we, uh, we wanted to know what are the functional outcomes and that was from the questionnaire study. And what we found is that chorioamnionitis indeed increased the burden of uh, wheezing disorders whether it was reported by the caregiver or by the physicians or use of respiratory medications, going to the doctor for respiratory causes, etc. And in a subgroup which was followed till two years, uh, that seemed to remain. Mm. Now, you might say, well, what does it mean? And there are now many studies which actually talk about lifelong lung trajectory where uh, lung function that is measured at birth, and if you are in the lower quartile, even for normal term infants, that seems to track throughout your life and may predict higher incidence of conditions such as asthma, but also in the fifth and sixth decade of life, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So there is growing awareness that perhaps pulmonary health, even as early as a few months of life, uh, may have lifelong implications of adverse pulmonary uh, outcomes. Wow, thank you so much. That was a, a great and thorough summary. Um, if there's one thing that you would want the audience to take away from, from your talk, your discussion, what would that be? I would, at this stage, we are at a very early stage of knowing what to do with these. Are there uh, things, for example, that we could change, that we could prevent? At this stage, I would say it is primarily being aware that they need closer follow-up. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, these 35 weekers are generally uh, not followed in a, any particular, particularly rigorous way. Uh, they are just sent out and clubbed with all the other healthy babies. And what our study says is that perhaps we need to pay closer attention. Uh, can uh, interventions be made? Um, is there a possibility of changing, for example, environmental exposure to those? Um, avoidance of uh, smoke, or diesel particulate matter or other things. Mm -hmm. I think those are questions that our study opens up and, and I think it, it will need further study. That's great, thank you very much, Dr. Kalapur. Um, that's a wrap from the 2017 Hot Topics in Neonatology meeting here in Washington, D.C.